Here are some things to consider. Although the symptoms of ADHD as I have described them are correct, clinical researchers like myself have a much deeper appreciation for or understanding of the nature of these symptoms. So let me explain them the way I understand them and not just the way the DSM-5 lists them. And that is because the symptoms in the DSM-5 are fairly superficial, were developed mainly on children, were not well tested with adults, and as a result don't seem to apply to adults as well as they do to children. So it helps if the clinician, the professional, has this richer understanding of what to look for in someone with adult ADHD. Now we've said that ADHD involves these two dimensions of neuropsychological deficits. The first of these to develop in childhood is usually the problem with inhibition, the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. What they look like, however, is much more than just motor hyperactivity or restlessness. It's not just a problem with inhibiting motor actions. In addition, as the DSM-5 points out, there are problems with inhibiting verbal behavior, which are manifested through things like talking excessively, not giving others a chance to converse in the conversation, interrupting others inappropriately, and so on. But besides those two problems with inhibition, there are at least three others that are not mentioned in the DSM-5. One of them is impulsive thinking or cognition, in which the individual has difficulties suppressing unwanted thoughts from entering into their stream of consciousness, particularly when they are working on tasks or pursuing goals. During those times, most typical people would suppress these unwanted thoughts and would focus on the task at hand. But people with ADHD, because of their inhibitory problems, often have difficulties not thinking about these irrelevant ideas or thoughts. In addition, we also see adults with ADHD engaging in very rapid decision making which means that they don't think about or deliberate the consequences of the actions they're considering doing before they do them. Instead, they appear to think impulsively and act on those ideas impulsively as well. Another problem with impulsiveness is what we call impulsive motivation. This simply means that people with ADHD prefer to have more immediate but smaller rewards and other consequences, rather than deferring their gratification and working toward larger, later rewards. So that delay of gratification is very difficult for them, and they often find themselves engaging in things that give them immediate pleasure or rewards, even if these are not the most optimal ways they should be spending their time. In teens and young adults with ADHD, we may see this in their development of internet or gaming addictions, among others, in which they are opting to play games because they're such fun and provide immediate gratification, rather than studying or doing schoolwork or completing the tasks they've agreed to do for their employers. Yet another area of impulsiveness is impulsive emotion. This is also not mentioned in the DSM-5, but it is just as central to ADHD as are the other symptoms that are mentioned in our diagnostic manual. By impulsive emotion or poor emotional self-regulation, what we mean is that people with ADHD show their emotions very quickly when they've been provoked. Now, these emotions are different from what we see in a mood disorder in several respects. First, the emotions are provoked by things that happen to us, just as are the emotions of typical people. What distinguishes them is that the person with ADHD shows them very quickly and often to a more extreme degree. But we can also understand the emotion. It's reasonable, rational, 
It makes sense to us. We too might have felt the same way, but we wouldn't have shown the emotion, or at least not to that degree. We would have inhibited the initial emotion and engaged in various ways to calm ourselves down. And adults with ADHD have difficulty doing that. Their emotions are quite impulsive, often more extreme, and they struggle to get control of them if those strong emotions have been provoked. But they are understandable nonetheless. In a mood disorder, the emotions are long duration, not short as in emotions. In a mood, the emotions may be lasting for days or weeks. We also don't understand what provoked them. They don't make sense to us. We can't see what's making the person depressed or manic or necessarily anxious. Also, the emotions are often extreme, capricious, and labile or variable, especially the emotion of irritability. So all of these are ways that we distinguish a mood disorder from the emotional problems that adults with ADHD have. Again, the emotions are provoked, but impulsive, a little more extreme, hard to get control of, but they're understandable, they're situation specific, they often pass relatively quickly, and they're not bizarre or extreme, at least not like in a mood disorder. So you can see that there are at least five domains in which inhibition interferes with functioning in adults. Motor behavior, verbal behavior, their thinking, their motivation, they want things now rather than later, and in their emotions. As I've said earlier, the hyperactive behavior often seen in children with ADHD declines markedly with age, so that by adulthood, those hyperactive symptoms are not very useful for making a diagnosis. The adult may feel restless, may show some need to be busy and engaging in lots of different tasks, which they don't finish, but we don't see them climbing on furniture, driven by motors, or in other ways acting that hyperactive. But they may still show signs of some restlessness when they are required to stay seated for long periods of time. Now, how can we understand the inattention symptoms beyond just the way they're described in the DSM-5? We need to understand that there are at least six different kinds of attention that our brain allows us to have. ADHD does not interfere with all of these kinds of attention. Such things as arousal, alertness, the focus of attention, and so on. Instead, ADHD interferes with sustained attention. A better term for that is persistence toward goals, toward tasks, persistence toward the future in general. ADHD is interfering with the ability to string together long chains of motor actions needed to accomplish a longer term goal. They can't persist toward their goals or assigned tasks. In other words, the problem with attention is one of attention to the future. And that's a very special kind of inattention. Along with that, in order to persist toward our goals and our future, we have to resist responding to distracting events, which are simply events that are not relevant to the goals that we're pursuing. And we must inhibit responding to these if we are going to accomplish the work we want to do. And that is what adults with ADHD struggle to do as well. They often react to events that are happening around them, even if those events have nothing to do with what they should be doing at this time. Now, we all will get distracted from time to time during our work. And when we do, we deal with the distraction, and then we get back to finishing the task at hand. We return to or re-engage the incompleted work. People with ADHD struggle to do that also. Once they've been distracted away from their work or tasks, they find it hard to go back 
and resume the incompleted goal or activity. Instead, they are off pursuing other things, other distractions, skipping from one uncompleted activity to another and not finishing much of anything. Now, the ability to re-engage work that we've been distracted from is not a problem with attention. It shows that there's a problem with working memory. Working memory is a very special kind of memory that is given to us in our frontal lobes, the forward part of the brain. And in this kind of memory, we are actively holding in mind our goals, the steps we intended to pursue to get there, and what progress we're making toward those goals. It's all actively held in our mind, and we're using it to keep ourselves on task, focus our effort, and persist over time. People with ADHD have serious impairments in working memory. They can't hold in mind information about what they're supposed to be doing for very long, and it's easily disrupted by other events that happen around them that aren't relevant to the goal, but nonetheless distract them. In that way, they're a lot like older people, such as myself. Once you get past age 55 or so, you begin to lose some of your working memory. And you may go into a room and forget why you went there, because you couldn't hold the goal in mind for very long. So we see the same thing in ADHD, but it is much, much worse. Finally, as I've said, another attention problem that goes with ADHD is attention to the self, the ability to be aware of and monitor ourselves as we go about our daily activities and to compare what we're doing against what our goals were. So self-awareness or self-monitoring is very important to accomplishing our goals. And adults with ADHD, as I said earlier, often have diminished self-awareness. And that is why we can't rely exclusively on what they tell us about how they're functioning in their life. We must get information from others. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may not know it, but I have just suggested that ADHD involves most of the brain's executive functions. The executive functions are that set of mental abilities that we use to pursue goals, get ready for the future, and solve problems. People with ADHD, as is evident here, have lots of difficulties with these executive abilities. <coughs> Excuse me. These executive functions give us self-control, self-regulation over time to prepare for the future in order to improve our welfare. And people with ADHD have lots of trouble with that. So let me go back and specifically list for you <coughs> excuse me, the seven executive functions that ADHD is likely to be impairing. The first, as I've mentioned, is self-awareness and self-monitoring. The second I've mentioned is inhibition or self-restraint. The third is working memory, and there are two kinds of working memory. Nonverbal, in which we use visual imagery to think about what we're going to do, to reflect back on our relevant past, which we call hindsight, and then to think ahead from that about what might happen next, foresight. That's the nonverbal aspect of working memory, holding images about the past and the future in mind that are related to our goals. The second type of working memory is verbal working memory. Basically, it is self-speech. We talk to ourselves. In the case of little children, they do it out loud. But by the time they are out of elementary school, this voice has moved into their head. They've internalized it, and they now have a mind's voice that they can use to talk privately to themselves in order to guide themselves 
to do what they've been asked to do or to pursue their own goals. So think of working memory as the mind's eye, visual imagery, and the mind's voice. And we use both of these in order to stay on task and accomplish our goals. And people with ADHD struggle with both of them. I like to think of working memory very much like a GPS in a car. We get in the car and we enter a destination into the GPS. That's our goal, right? Then the GPS brings up images of the relevant surroundings, the maps, and it also gives us verbal instructions of how to move through that region, those maps. So the GPS is using images and words to guide us over time to reach a destination. And working memory works very similar to that. And so when it's disrupted, as it is in ADHD, people will have a lot of difficulty accomplishing their goals, pursuing the future, staying on task. Now, I've mentioned the others already. There's a problem with emotional self-regulation. There's also a motivational deficit, problems with self-motivation. Instead of pursuing longer-term goals that have bigger rewards, which requires that we motivate ourselves, people with ADHD instead right, opt to do shorter-term things for which they can get more immediate rewards and consequences that don't require self-motivation. Finally, Although I haven't mentioned it before, ADHD adults and children have problems with planning and problem solving, both of which are very important to future directed goal oriented behavior. We must be able to think about various plans and options for what we hope to accomplish and choose the best one. And if we encounter problems or obstacles along the way to our goal, we have to be able to stop, inhibit, think about what we're doing, and see if we can come up with multiple other possibilities that might overcome the problem. Problem solving. People with ADHD struggle to do these things as well. <clears throat> you can now see that ADHD in an adult is a much more impairing disorder than people originally believed. It is a problem not just with attention and inhibition, but with the executive functions, with self-regulation. And that helps us to understand why, if ADHD in an adult is not treated, it can lead to all of the difficulties you see on this slide. Difficulties with education, problems with family conflict, difficulties getting along with others, not just people in the family, but people we encounter outside, friends and acquaintances. It can lead to problems following the law, in which people with ADHD are more likely to engage in illegal behavior or antisocial behavior. It can lead them into substance abuse, such as smoking more, using more marijuana or alcohol, or even using illegal substances. Again, this is because of their impulsiveness, which leads them to be prone to addiction. We see a pattern of risk-taking behavior, may be evident in their sexual behavior, <clears throat> in which they engage in more sexual activity with others without using contraception, which leads to an increased risk of teenage or young adult pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease. Because they don't think through the consequences of what they're doing, their risk-taking often leads them to experience many more accidental injuries than do other people. Not just injuries at home, but while driving or while engaged in sports or while working in the workplace. People with ADHD suffer a lot more in their accidental injuries, to the point where children with ADHD are twice as likely to die by age 10, and adults with ADHD are five times more likely 
to die by age 45 as a result of their risk-taking and proneness to accidental injuries. By adolescents, there's also a growing risk for attempting suicide because of their impulsiveness. If they're depressed and they think about suicide, they're more likely to attempt it because of their lack of inhibition. They also have difficulties with risk-taking while driving, speeding with a motor vehicle, parking where they shouldn't, getting more traffic citations for all sorts of driving infractions, driving while under the influence of drugs or alcohol as well. So their driving is very risky and it leads to a lot more crashes, citations, and even license suspensions. As you can imagine, these problems with executive functioning will interfere not just with school, but with work performance, their occupational functioning. And of course, people who are impulsive don't manage their finances or their money very well, particularly their use of credit cards for impulse buying. People who don't think about their actions also don't look after their health very well. Instead of eating well, with healthy nutrition, exercising often, and getting good medical and dental care that is preventive in nature, they tend to avoid doing those things. Eating poor diets, often filled with junk food, high in carbohydrates and sugars, and often low in proteins or healthier foods. This leads them to a growing risk for obesity, twice the risk for obesity of other adults, and eventually to risk for coronary heart disease, or CHD. You can imagine that these deficits in self-control would certainly affect one's marriage or one's cohabiting relationships with others. And we do see that. The impulsiveness certainly leads to problems in living at home and accomplishing our work at home when we live with others. Because of the impulsive emotion, there's a greater likelihood of reactive aggression, frustration, and hostility. And sometimes that can lead to interpersonal violence toward others when they're provoked. Should they have children, you can well see that these problems with self-control would interfere with their ability to monitor their children, create more consistent home routines, give more reasonable consequences for good and bad behavior, control their emotions more when they have to deal with their children and become frustrated in doing so. So ADHD leads to a variety of impairments across nearly every major domain of life activities that we have studied to date. <clears throat> Luckily, treatment reduces many of these risks, particularly treatment with medication.